Thank you to the Governor of the Bank of Spain. Thank you, Barbara. Um, let me just introduce Francesco Storacci. Many of you will know the former Chief Executive of the Italian utility NL, now with the private equity firm EQT. Francesco, very good to see you. Um, it feels as though there is so much to do just on the back of the conversations that we had, Anna, that Jonathan had with you, George, and the comments that the Governor just made uh, now. Uh, essentially, let's ask the competing for growth question. I'm going to try and ask it in a nice way and a nasty way. Let's start, let's start with the nice way. The nice way is to say that uh, President Ursula von der Leyen has just asked Mario Draghi to come up with a competitiveness report. Let's say that, let's say that Draghi calls you. What do you say is the essential thing that you need to do to ensure competitiveness and growth? in Europe. And, I'm, and Francesco, I'm going to ask you first, because you've been witnessing the conversation so far. You're asking me because I'm Italian. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's right. And also because so Draghi will take your mistake, call. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I think, you know, we just heard there are many, many good things in Europe. It's a very large market. It's a very rich market. It's a very sophisticated market. And technology-wise, it's uh, in many, time, in many ways, also the leadership in, in certain technologies that are becoming much more important going forward. Uh, I would uh, definitely advise uh, Mr. Draghi and therefore Ursula von der Leyen to remove, uh, rather than add, remove regulation, remove some constraints, look at the Eurozone as a one zone and not as a sum of zones. And in any case, try to advise regulators around Europe that their job is not to stifle competition, but to increase it and to make sure that single countries champions, as we had in the past, are substituted by European champions, as the US is doing at the US level. So enlarge the scope and uh, get out of the single country reference uh, framework that we have had uh, so far. I think that's really the most important thing we should do. George, can I put the same to you? And also, can I just sort of steal an idea from Jonathan Hill? We, we were talking about Europe's conception of itself as a regulatory superpower. And you said something interesting just earlier about the fact that post-financial crisis, we may have regulated away risk, but also regulated away opportunity. And how much does that sense of Europe as a regulatory superpower stand in the way of competing for growth? Well, it, you know, good regulation should encourage growth because it provides a stable environment, a predictable environment in which capital and businesses can make long-term bets, as you know, Anna was saying in her opening remarks, that every time you start a business, you're taking a view on the long term and you're committing your capital um, alongside your, your bank. And so, you know, can, I think this, we've got to get away, and I say this as someone who was a, who was a conservative, that all regulation is a bad thing. It, it, it could be used to Europe's advantage um, as a stable, predictable jurisdiction in a world in which that's not the case. Um, so, I mean, I remember there's sort of echoes of um, Mario Monti uh, a decade earlier when I was in the finance minister in the UK, you know, being asked to produce a competitiveness report and uh, <laughs> it just wasn't properly implemented. So the first thing I'd say about Mario Draghi's uh, report, almost whatever he comes up with, make sure it's implemented. I'm sure it's going to be a sensible report. Um, I would also look to complete the work actually that Jonathan started on the capital markets union. Um, I, I think, you know, one of, I don't want to kind of bang on about Brexit as people would say, but you know, the, the departure of the UK means you don't have that big financial services centre trying to shape European Union policy in this space. And, uh, and I think you should kind of overly compensate for that and go for a deeper capital markets union. And I know it's the kind of buzzword of the moment, but, you know, as Anna was saying also, it is potentially the transformative technology of our generation. I think the European Union you know, potentially with other European countries like the UK, get itself in a place where it quite rapidly comes up with predictable and growth-friendly rules on AI, 
you know, it could become a quite exciting place for that technology to locate itself. Anna, what's your suggestion? So um, I obviously agree with everything Federico and George have said. Um, so capital markets union, a big market, removing obstacles. But if you think about, um, you know, what Mario Draghi has been asked to do, um, you know, where does growth come from? It comes fundamentally from three sources, population growth, natural resources, and technology. And arguably, technology is important for the first two, right? Mm. The fact that we have um, billions of people in the world is because we made huge advances in health and so on and natural resources. By the way, fin they finish. So at the end, it all comes back to technology and how we use it. And so it all comes back to this once in a civilized, I mean, a civilization change. Uh, Carlos Slim said this is not a, a this, this is not changes in our time. It's, it's a time of change. Mm -hmm. So un cambio de época. And this is really what we need to understand. And Europe understands it. We just, again, we need to take the right approach. And let me just focus on, 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 on one idea. The first is that there is no conflict between growth and inclusiveness. There is no conflict. And it, sometimes I get the sense that we, need, we want to redistribute, but you know, if, if we don't grow, there's going to be very little to redistribute. And so again, there is no conflict on the country. It's actually tied together in a virtuous circle. And again, as we think about Draghi's um, and, and what Europe needs to do to achieve this vision, which I think is the right one, we want to have a, I would say, a fairer society in terms of not leaving people behind than what the US model uh, would suggest. I think competition is the key word. And that's why I compete for growth. I love the title. Well, it's not mine, by the way, it's my team. So. Because without competition, the market economy doesn't work. And I, I use very often with my team the two hunters in, in Africa and the lion, right? Uh, and there's this idea that if you run more than the other one, you know, you cannot run more than the lion, but you can run more than the next guy. <laughs> that seems to imply that one of them is going to be eaten up by the lion. Yes, it the, does. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but let me just put it to you in a different way. If both are really well trained, and you know, if there's a tree to climb and they're ready, and if they have the right tools, they can both get away. And in a way, the lion is all these things that can eat us up in <laughs> Europe. What can eat us up? A culture where we think the state is going to take care of us and it's going to eliminate all risk. A regulation where one mistake is one mistake too many. And this is really what we need to change. So again, I do think there is a way where it's not a race where one wins and one loses. It's not a race where you increase taxes to the biggest companies so you can redistribute. No, you can have lower taxes and everybody is, is better off. And so again, you, and that's why I like this image behind us. We're competing not just among European states, we're competing with the world. And you know, there is no reason, and globalization and what's happened in the last 50 years is not perfect, but it's taken, I think, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And so we now need to improve the system because of this wave of AI, which is really going to be tremendous, and we need to get this right. So, but, but, but Anna, can I put you, in fact, to all three of you, that I think there would be people who would listen to this conversation this morning mm. and say, okay, yes, competition would be good, you know, we need to think about, you know, a pro-growth regulation, all of that would be good, but they would probably say it's not enough, right? They would look at the IMF numbers the governor mentioned and say they've, they've scaled back their numbers of growth from, you know, nearly 4% to 3%. They've looked at developed economies and said those developed economies are going to grow 1.5%, lower than that, 1.4% next year. Some economies in Europe are not even going to grow at that level. And it's just not enough. And adding to your population, natural resources and technology, Anna, they would say, we need a, a different scale of injection of capital, private capital and public capital. Mm -hmm. And they appreciate the point about debt and the burden of debt on governments, but they would argue that there needs to be some way of bringing in a higher level of investment to make changes both in innovation, meet the innovation challenge, and public services. And I just wonder how you answer that particular challenge, because that seems to me fundamental to the question of growth. And I'll start with you. 
Well, you put it really easy. <laughs> it's the banks. Go on. Well, so Federico was saying it, and in a way, George said it. Now that you're a banker, by the way, you must agree with me on this. Um, um, you did. I, I agreed with you before, but I particularly <laughs> agree with you now. Well, I mean, respectfully, you raised my taxes in the UK. <laughs> you, d you did tell me at the time. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, in, in, I, I'm telling you, like I said publicly today, I am fine if I pay more taxes. Why should I pay more taxes than other companies? But let's take that offline. But no, but I'm very happy for us to have that conversation <laughs> here. <just> a, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but it goes to the point. You know, we need, and that's why we need to get away of these banks, and, and then we're going to get the reputation of banks. Banks, unless somebody has a better system to put on the table, and I have not seen it, banks are essential for you to be able to buy a house, for him to be able to, you started a business. You need financing, right? I'm sure you got some from some banks, and if not, well, next time, please uh, ask us. <laughs> but that is exactly the point. We need financing for growth, and that financing in Europe for small companies comes 70% from the banks. The, the, uh, sorry. And so, so, how do you get that going? Is, Yes, so Francesco, you want to Am I answering away? the question or I'm just saying? Nearly. I, I, let's, let's come back to I just to wanted to make that point. No, no, so no I, I get it, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that Europe looks as though it's not enabling enough capital to go into investment well, by comparison, for example, with the US right. or with China. Francesco, Well, sorry. I think, you know, capital looks at the world, not just at Europe. Mm. So why would one invest in Europe rather than elsewhere? That's a real point, because there is not an infinite amount of capital. There is a limited amount, and it goes wherever capital thinks, right or wrong, that the return will be best compared to the risk they take, the, the capital is taking. So risk-wise, Europe is good. I mean, it's considered to be, let's assume that it is a right assumption, it's considered to be a, a relatively risk-free area. But what about the returns? And we go back to taxation. What about the, the, secu the certainty that taxation doesn't, doesn't change day to day? What about other things? And in particular, what about demand growth? You know, what happens to the growth in demand in Europe? And of course, you have demand growth when you have demographics also, not, not just economic growth. And demographics in Europe is not a strong point, okay? We don't have a lot of demography growth in Europe. And I, th I think we have to understand that most of the growth in Europe is about increasing quality or quantity of supply of goods and services mm -hmm. to the same amount of population. That is increasingly sophisticated, yes. if you want. But it's a, it's a different, it's a very different and, and tricky game. And, and technology helps and changes. And we, we are lucky that we have this continuous technology evolution. Without that, we would be uh, in the cemetery, if you want. So, I didn't say the same <laughs> I said the museum. So, so, so I think really the, the story in Europe is we have to start growing mentally also. We have to understand that we, ha we can have more children. We can start to do things that elsewhere are normal. And if you look at the fact that if between now and 2050, another billion and a half of, uh, of us are going to be around, and most of them in cities, by the way, uh, Africa is the only place where population growth happens also in rural areas. Elsewhere, rural areas go down and cities go up. So Europe is already almost all in cities. For, for so we are already there. Can, can, I, can I ask the that's question? That's really yeah. what we need to do. Focus on the infrastructure that is needed for cities. Focus on what we need to change in our cities to make them more livable and attract more people in them. So I, I want to... Can, can I be yeah. a moderator for one yeah. second? Thank you. So there is a super interesting question, which I think you're better placed than anybody to answer. And given you're not running in it anymore, I think you can no. freely speak <laughs> about it. So, you know, there's a huge, uh, there's still a lot of noise in Europe about the IRA in the US. Yeah. And that yeah. is, uh, you know, uh, the competition. a nation nationalistic decision. Yeah. And I know that you and others say, that is not the case. Would you, as an investor in energy, why would you put more capital in the US versus Europe, where we need, you know, we need to improve the, the grid, the infrastructure in, in countries like the UK and Spain and others? Why would you invest 
in the US rather than Europe, in your sector? Because well, that, that does answer your question, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this question. is a good example. Thank it's you. a good example which you forgot to tell us about. Yeah, because, you know, <laughs> the, the IRA is, uh, is a very well-conceived instrument because it pushes companies to invest in a limited amount of time to get a quite secure benefit for a longer time. So it ends in 2032. Whatever you do now, you get all the years until then. So you're forced to do everything at the moment. Okay? The difference with Europe is that the benefit and the, the incentive is given through fiscal, mostly fiscal advantages. Europe cannot replicate that because we don't have a fiscal compact. So countries do not have that. I mean, it, should, it would take a lot of work to do that. But it, it's it could not be impossible. Done, but it, it's super complex. The, the Europe uses a different tool, which is mostly grants or, or um, facilitated loans. There is a subtle difference. It's not just a spreadsheet. Okay? The difference is that the entrepreneurial risk that you have in the US is larger. So you get the fiscal benefit once your investment is done, mm -hmm. it's on the ground, and starts to work. Until then, it's your risk. In Europe, you get the money first. It's so it's, it's a huge it's a mental difference, difference from an entrepreneurial standpoint. And I think that is the, the big difference between the two systems. But Francesco, presumably, I appreciate that's a cultural point. Huge difference. But people respond to incentives. Yeah. Entrepreneurs right. respond to incentives. And you see the response going, going heavily so, in the US. So, George, George mm. and the I guess this is... has, favor, has favored the US of course. instead of Europe. Because the incentives massively And favor. this is what, that's why I said, we know what works. I was saying it before. If we know that works better, why don't we try to do a bit of the same instead of thinking, you know, there's only one path. And this is what I'm saying. We have the right goal, but we're so trying to get there. Like, it's like trying to swim across the Amazon with stones in your pocket, right? So true. I think we could just copy a little bit, and it would not be right. difficult, okay? Well, well hold on, we, we, say, we say we could. George, George, answer this if you would, because I think the governor mentioned Spain's debt to GDP ratio yeah. of about 110%. The, you know, everyone's edged up a little, and yet there's still an edged orthodoxy. Edged up a lot, yeah. Yeah, edged up a lot, fair point. But there's still an orthodoxy around 100% debt to GDP ratio being somehow the standard, the benchmark. If you were a ch chancellor now of a European country, finance minister of a European country, how would you respond to Francesco well, Lana saying, we need to provide more funds to incentivize and drive private sector investment? Now, personally, I'm a bit more um, suspicious of attempting to create in on the European continent, a set of government subsidies for private businesses, because A, I don't think we've got the money. So, you know, we don't have the world's reserve currency, even the euro. Um, you know, in all of these countries, they're fiscally constrained, which is why actually the opportunity for big tax reductions is not there in any European country, really. Um, you don't have fiscal union inside the EU. And although it made some quite big steps forward during the last 10 years, it's still, you know, it's a monetary union, not a fiscal union. Um, and I think you'll find in America there will be a ton of stories about poorly spent money and schemes that didn't work and, and so on. Um, I do think you should look to Europe's advantages and, and maximize them. So, you know, one, the, probably the most controversial topic in European politics is immigration, the yeah. most difficult topic. But it is potentially also an opportunity. Okay, so lots of people want to come and live in Europe from around the world. If we organized ourselves better, those people wouldn't be those who managed to get themselves on a boat across the Mediterranean, but because they had an amazing degree in science or they came from the, some top university. You know, we can be a magnet for talent with an organized immigration system, which would also address our demographics. Uh, and. We should also, I think, play on some other European skills, which are our education systems and particularly our universities. You know, European universities used to lead the world. I think they are a magnet for growth. That's where I would put my public investment rather than into industrial subsidies. Um, and I would also, and, and create, you know, there already is a good sci European scientific network and uh, double down on that. It's great the UK is rejoining that. 
Um, and where you put and, and invest in the in the infrastructure, the kind of transport and digital infrastructure across Europe. That's where I put the public money, um, and play to Europe's strengths. I mean, it's still the place that most people in the world would like to come live uh, alongside the U.S. It's got, you know, it's got an enormous attractiveness. You know, look at look at this wonderful city of Madrid. I was walking around yesterday evening when I arrived. You know, so many places in the world would dream of having yeah. a, a city like that. Um, and so. You know, I, th I think we sometimes, you know, you can use the kind of museum to your advantage. It's a fantastic place to live. There's a very high quality of life. There's largely stable government compared to most other jurisdictions. Use those to attract real talent, invest in the skills, change the demographics, uh, and you've got a big opportunity. Uh, and if you, can be just, if you can be dispassionate about Europe and just stand back and look at the map of the world. You mean why I'm always very passionate about Yes, <laughs> but I mean dispassionate in the sense that if you look at Mexico, if you look at Brazil, if you look at, and you listen to what Francesco's saying about the limits, and George is saying about the limits on the extent to which Europe can replicate what the US has done with the Inflation Reduction Act and other forms of support, where do you think the real growth in the next two to three years will be? So let me just say again, I think Europe is, by, a, by some distance, the best model that we have in the world, okay? The best. And the okay. proof is in the pudding. Everybody wants to come to Europe. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is it sustainable the way we're running it? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. When I get asked at Santander, and I said this the first day of Two weeks after I took over here, you know, the only way to make Santander sustainable is to deliver the numbers in the right way. So again, we had everything necessary to succeed nine years ago, but we had to make fundamental changes. You know, we're using our Pereira building in, in, in Santander as, as the symbol of the change of Santander. I cannot run Santander as we run it 10 years ago because I might be around one, two, three, four, five years. I ain't gonna be around in 20 years. And the same thing for Europe, it ain't sustainable. It's not sustainable. We need to modify the model. And again, going back to Mario Draghi and answering your question, we need to, you know, one of the most important things in a board, in a company, in a manager, what are the questions I should be asking myself? Mm. What are we solving for? Why do we want a digital euro? Why do we want to create a third currency when some of the reasons why we want to build it can be built without the risks of a third currency, and I'm not going to get into that, but in the case of Europe, we need to ask ourselves, okay, do we have a clear goal and vision? I think yes. I think we all agree that we need to be the most innovative society in the world. But how, you know, it's the same thing as I tell my team, we want to be a responsible global platform. That is not enough. And we started eight years ago with the corporate bank global platforms. How do we define them? It's implemented. It's a super successful horizontal business. Then wealth management, then payments. We recently announced retail commercial where we define the principles. That's what Europe needs to do. So Mario Draghi needs, I'm not being dispassionate, I'm being passionate because I firmly believe that what he needs and what we need to help is, are we asking ourselves the right questions? And the right questions is, you know, for this to be, this, you know, where is growth going to come from? We need an immigration policy that accepts that we need more people. You know, there are different numbers, but probably in Spain you have, what, two million people that are not sort of formally part of the economy. They don't pay taxes, they're underground, etc. In Europe, that is a much bigger number. That is one thing we need. Second thing we need, I go back to competition. We need to answer the question, what is a critical infrastructure in the digital age? The governor said it. At times of change, this disproportionate, you know, um, let's say, monopolies being created. So, what is a digital infrastructure, a critical infrastructure? You know, this is a critical infrastructure. The operating systems is a digital infrastructure. And so, we need to understand how, what that means for taxes, what that means for competition. And this is not an easy answer, by the way. Now, with AI, it becomes even harder. And I tremble when Jonathan, and I think you, or mm -hmm. said, 
that we're starting to put out new rules without really having thought through the consequences. And so I think, you know, again, Europe mm -hmm. needs to answer those questions so we can then provide the solutions. And it's not an easy thing. And let me just finish by saying, um, uh, just to illustrate the point on competition, everybody talks about the Industrial Revolution and horses and that having a faster horse was not a solution, right? Well, you know, in a way what we're doing is, let's think of Santander as the horse and Apple as the car, right? Now, Santander is building a car. It's not a perfect car. But the way the market rules are working is that even though I have a car, I'm being asked to not drive the car more than 20 miles per hour whilst Apple and some of these guys can drive it at 50 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not great for my shareholders, but by the way, society also loses. And so we need to land these sort of, you know, consequences of consumers now having different choices, having, you know, and how can we invest? And do you, do you so I think those are the things that the, the study has to answer, and they need academia, they need people like Federico, they need people that understand the sectors and the complexities of the sectors, they need academia, they need, of course, public officials and so on, but this is something which I think, it, it, again, it's hard, but it can be done. True. Do, do you think it's fair, uh, Anna's point, that somehow our political classes have conspired to provide a different regulatory framework and set of requirements on, if you like, established institutions, mm. banks, and somehow let new tech companies get away with it? Well, I think, it, well, I think it's certainly true these tech companies are unbelievably big, for, and they're American, and we don't really have any kind of European counterpart. Um, and of course they're ubiquitous and we all have them in our pockets. And so they are hard to regulate because they're not in the European jurisdiction. They've become incredibly important to the modern economy and very important and much loved by consumers who use them all the time. I think if, you know, I think as they move into the banking space and I think Anna's right that, you know, she sees the competition as the phone in her pocket rather than the bank branch next door. Uh, I think they will end up being regulated. I think they will end up, over time, both in the US and in the e European Union, being regulated as financial entities, and that's something they certainly are aware of as they move into this uh, space. I just, can I make one final, you know, if, I think something we all as Europeans need to think about is, you know, we have not talked about security in this conference. If we were having this conference in the US or in China, national security, you're about to have General Petraeus on this stage, you know, would be a big issue. And the fact that Europeans feel we don't even have to think about it or talk yeah. about it, even though there's a war happening on our continent and there's, you know, an emerging war in the Middle East, you know, shows how much I think we've also sort of subcontracted that to the Americans. <clears throat> um, and I do think, you know, uh, again, coming from a country with Europe's probably, you know, most deployable army at the moment, apart from Ukraine, um, we need to, you know, start thinking more about European defense and security. And it, I just observe it doesn't come up, yeah. not just here, but at any European conversation. And the fact you've got a general, American general coming along, you know, you could ask him what his attitude is towards European's defense. Francesco. I was wondering, wh why is it that this large uh, IT companies have not yet moved in many other spaces? Why is it that they have not come into the energy field? Why are they not so actively pursuing banking? I mean, there is a reason behind this that is basically regulation. These companies don't like regulation by and large. They are shy of regulation in general, okay? And uh, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a world that has a different mindset and also a completely different view of the return and risk profile. Uh, this is the same reason why they're not investing in infrastructure, for example. Uh, so I think they are so large and so pervasive in our life, but they are not everywhere. And we should not demonize 
or, or be afraid that they will get everywhere around us. I mean, I think they, they have their own space, and I probably that space will shrink as regulation finally slowly per gets there. And the big theme that we have today is the incredible task we have to carry on in changing the infrastructure that manages our lives. That's really the major effort going on at the moment. And, and the numbers are staggering in terms of financial investments and physical work mm. that needs to be done to transform industries from one to another world. And which is which is something going on, by the way, and you see the results every day around us, although we, we, we're not fully conscious about it. Yeah. And capital is at work trying to find solutions to make it happen quickly. Can, can, can I just finish up just a, a, a quick round at the end, because I know we've talked a lot about Europe. Looking beyond Europe, which national economy do you look at and think in growth terms that is an exciting story and one that people are not paying enough attention to. Francesco, then George, and I'm going to finish up with Anna. I mean, I get out and I look at the world, I still think Europe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it's a 600 million consumer, rich consumer market, super sophisticated, with a relatively good infrastructure and a governance that is complex but quite sophisticated and unique. So I like it a lot. Okay. Going, looking from outside, I like the U.S. too, but I think this is a part of the world which only lacks a little bit of zest and adjustment, but it can fly. Zest and adjustment we can do. Uh, George. Gosh, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I actually teach at Stanford University and I'm constantly astonished by the U.S., but um, I think, uh, oh, I don't know, I, uh, well, I think what's going on in the Middle East is the Gulf states is pretty interesting and transformative. I was just at the big conference in Saudi Arabia. It's amazing how quickly things are changing there. And I would say a kind of country that doesn't get enough attention in Europe, even though people are all aware of it, is South Korea. It's becoming a kind of cultural leader. You know, I notice for a sort of younger generation um, in music and in film and things you would never think that South Korea could kind of lead the West on or influence the West on. But it, and it's not a country that we spend much time thinking about or talking about. Anna. Well, I obviously think it's uh, Europe and the Americas, which is Santander footprint. <laughs> uh, I think Europe has a huge, huge amount of advantages, huge opportunity, as Federico said. I believe Europe, when we're at the right side of the range of available options, we're unbeatable. And I think Draghi's study could be incredibly helpful if, if we do get to ask, answer the questions. But I love the Americas. I, lo I love the US, Mexico is amazing. All of Latin America, demographics from 650 to over 800 million people in the next uh, you know, 25 years. So it's one of the few regions in the world that actually is gonna grow. So I think the combination of Europe and the Americas is unbeatable. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, we, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a break coffee, have a bite. I hope one of the points of this conference is that everyone get, can get to meet and talk. Um, we'll break for just under, I think, half an hour. Um, uh, when you're ushered back in, please do come back in. Uh, George mentioned that most conferences in Europe don't think about national security. This one really is. Uh, we have uh, General Petraeus, former head of the CIA, here talking about conflict at a time where, sadly, there is too much of it. Um, but before then, please join me in thanking uh, Francesco Storacci, uh, George Osborne, and Anna Bottini.